Greetings fellow Earthlings and welcome to this tiny garage. When I was a very small kid, a man came to our house called Mick. Now Mick was a chippy, which meant that Mick was a tradesman that specialised in carpentry. Now I don't really remember why Mick was at our house, probably something to do with the fence, but I do remember that my job was to pester Mick with as many questions as I possibly could until my mum told me to leave Mick alone. Now I do remember this tasty morsel of information that I did get from Mick, and that was that when his Ford Escort work van had recently broken, he and his friend took the engine out, they took the engine apart, and not only did they replace all the bits that were broken, but they also got a hold of the specifications of that engine from the factory, and they blue printed the engine. And they went through and they made everything in that engine match whatever it was supposed to be at the factory, making it possibly better than new. Now I was very interested now and I asked Mick, hey, when you got it all back together, did you take it on the highway and go 100 miles an hour? Because in my head, it looked a bit more like this now. So Mick said, no, actually, I had to take it easy. I drove underneath 45 miles an hour for a couple of weeks while the engine ran in. Now to my young mind, that last statement was so counterintuitive that it stuck with me to this day and I vowed if ever I got the opportunity to blueprint an engine that I wanted a Ford Escort race van of my own. Now if ever there was an opportunity to look into that with a bit more detail, I think now is the time. Let's start off by finding out what a blueprint is or was. The blueprinting process was developed by Sir John Herschel over 170 years ago. It was popular as an early form of low-tech photocopying. A design on tracing paper was laid on top of photosensitive paper in the sunlight. The resulting image was developed with chemicals that included ferric ferrocyanide, also known as Prussian blue. The final result left a deep blue colour where the sun hit the paper and fine white lines where the design on the tracing paper had blocked the sun. Blueprints went out of popular use after the Second World War as technology started to move closer to machines that ultimately gave us the photocopier. The name blueprint stays with us today as a general term referring to any original plan, design or diagram. You can still find the blueprinting process today in more artistic endeavours known as the cyanotype. What does all of that mean for blueprinting an engine? One thing I've noticed is that when people are talking about blueprinting an engine, they're not always talking about the same thing. Now some people might say that what I'm doing to this engine is kind of like blueprinting it because I'm sort of measuring some things, I'm replacing a bunch of parts, and then I'm, when I'm putting it back together I'm hopefully going to torque all of those bolts down to the factory specs. However, that would be just scratching the surface of what it would really mean to blueprint an engine like this. So for a start, you would need the blueprints or the factory specifications to be able to measure to and check against. And then assuming that you were able to find something that wasn't within spec and trust that you had found that, you would then need the skill set and the tools to be able to do something about it. Now many of these problems you can't fix them with a Dremel. You may need a lathe or some other fanciful equipment. Now, someone who's blueprinting an engine, an engine rebuilder, they'll go through and they'll check all of the factory specs. They may also go even down to the detail of weighing the pistons and even individual nuts to make sure that everything was whatever they wanted it to be. And that's another thing too, someone who's rebuilding an engine, someone who's capable of blueprinting an engine may well be able to go beyond the factory specifications and say to you, hey, you know what, if I did this, that and the other, you could actually get your engine with a bit more power, blah, blah, blah. For example, we talked about in episode four about the blow-by gases that get past the rings on every combustion cycle. And so if you could tighten up those tolerances, you could get more power, more of that power would stay inside the combustion chamber. And then you'd also get cleaner oil and less um, pressure buildup in your crankcase just because that tolerance was closed up and someone with experience would be able to say, hey, yeah, you could do this and there'd be no downside, no binding or anything. 
And so that's just a small example of someone who's doing a blueprinting process. They really, they know the insides, ups and downs of an engine um, to really the nth degree. And that's difficult for to acquire overnight or in a DIY project. You'd need some engines that you were prepared to break to experiment with really. Now also, just the measuring part of being a engine blueprinter is a challenge because you need to be able to measure down to such tiny, tiny distances, down to an accuracy of one ten thousandth of an inch. Now it's difficult to understand just how small that is and there are some challenges that come with that kind of measurement as we will see. So just how small is small? When people talk about small things, they often refer to the size of a human hair, the diameter, and it is 0 0.002 inches across. That's a lot of zeros. Let's talk about zeros, specifically after the zero. So you get a zero and then a decimal point. That next zero is splitting whatever you're measuring into 10 tiny equal pieces. When we add two zeros, we're splitting that item into 100 different sections three zeros, then 1,000 equal little pieces, and then four zeros, we have 10,000 equal little pieces that you can measure. Now, engine tolerances are measured in one ten thousandth of an inch, 0 0.0001, and a human hair is 20 times bigger than that. So we are talking pretty small. We need to focus. Hit the notification bell. It's up there. Yes, please. Crankshaft stand. Now, I don't know how much it costs to replace a Porsche 996 crankshaft that you've dropped on the floor, and I want to keep it that way. So this is the Etsy portion of today's episode. I need a stand, I need a helping hand to put the crankshaft onto when I am doing other things with the bearing carrier. Those miscellaneous blocks of wood are coming in handy. If any of you are interested, those are four inch wood screws that I put into the blocks there and a couple of old leather gloves that I had in the garage. Seems to work okay. Now I need to clean everything up and I got these lint free cloths from the local parts store. And at this moment I realized they really are not lint free. If you're watching last week, you'll see that I got those Kimtech wipes. It was that moment in actual fact that caused me to go and purchase them. Right there, it looks like I'm using Kim wipes, but I hadn't actually bought them at that stage. Those are one-time use camera lens cloths that I keep in the garage for when I inadvertently spray my iPhone down with WD-40. And thank you to subscriber Fred Laracuente for sharing with the group that coffee filters make a great budget conscious alternative to Kim wipes. Thank you, Fred. Let the measuring begin. Here we go then, we're gonna aim really low. All I'm trying to do is see if there is a difference in size between the old main bearings and the new main bearings, because that might suggest that the old main bearings had some wear. And so I drew up a chart and here is my current digital caliper. And as you can see, it just doesn't have enough zeros. Two zeros after the decimal point is not gonna cut it. Plus it is a little bendy, let's be honest. So I did invest another $10 in one of these things. This of course is just a slightly less awful digital caliper, but it does have four zeros after the decimal point. We get inches and millimeters and fractions of inches. It's made from more metal and it does seem like it is a bit more serious and that's the one we're gonna to try today to see what we can do. Now I'm gonna spare you all of the measurements here because I decided to measure all of the 14 bearings and I measured them in three different places. So that's 42 different measurements, hence the need for that chart. The main bearings in this engine are plain bearings, which as the name suggests, they're pretty plain. They are just pieces of metal. We've all heard of their more exhilarating cousins, the ball bearings and the roller bearings. Um, but in this case, plain bearings are the order of the day. Their party piece is the fact that through the holes in them and that groove in the middle, engine oil at pressure is able to make the crankshaft journals and therefore the crankshaft ride on top of a super thin layer of oil, as thin as 0.000 four inches deep. 
And therefore, while we are measuring for wear here, there isn't actually supposed to be any. The crankshaft and the bearings aren't supposed to touch. But if they do happen to touch due to low oil pressure or perhaps a piece of dirt in the system, then the softer metal of the plain bearings is supposed to sacrifice itself instead of the expensive crankshaft. So then I needed to measure a sample. I took three of the new bearings and I decided I would measure them in the same way, same three places, wrote that down as well. Feeling like it's going well at this stage. Okay, to the results. Now here is that actual page of all of those results written down. When I have a page of miscellaneous numbers, I like to make a graph. Here's the first graph that I came out with. As you can see, we have some outliers there, some anomalies. I went back and re-measured those anomalies and found it suspiciously easy to get them back in line with the other measurements. So I made a second set of graphs and found that I still had some anomalies, but I am human. And as you know, we humans do like to read the tea leaves and I was beginning to see some trends. Perhaps there is more wear in the middle of the crankshaft where it's sagging a bit and definitely at the bottom and maybe a little bit more towards where the pulley end on all parts of the bearing. Don't listen to any of that, it's complete rubbish. As we also know, assumptions will kill you. And so while it is easy to look for the Harbour Freight tool as the scapegoat in this example, really, this is pilot error. I needed to learn how to measure. It might seem overly simplistic, but step one is to clean the object you intend to measure. We're measuring distances that we now know are smaller than the distance of a human hair. So any grit or any crazy Sasquatch hairs are going to make a difference to whatever measurement you're trying to find. You also need to clean your measuring device for the same reasons. To zero out or reset these calipers, I had much more success by holding the jaws shut and pressing the button than trying to hold on the plastic part. Also, resist the urge to use the plastic for anything. The wheel on the side is connected to that lower metal jaw, and you're going to have much more success and feel much cooler if you use that thumb wheel. Also, when you're measuring something, hold down on the jaws themselves to clamp onto the object you're trying to measure. You'll get a much more consistent result that way. And a very important one here is use the exact same part of the jaws to measure each time. I might even recommend putting a little mark on the jaws so you use the same part. In this case, these bearings have a curvature to them. And so in the back part of the jaws, it was slightly thicker. And sometimes I might catch that area a little bit and give those anomalies. And of course, measure more than once. And especially if you get distracted, <laughs> measure again. So did any of that make any difference? You bet it did. So that blue line there, that is the thickness of all of the new bearings. They are 0.975 inches thick. That's just under two and a half millimeters thick each. Now that pink line, I made it slightly thicker so you could see it. That is the measurements of all of the other bearings. They were all the same, 0.975 inches thick. So part of me is thinking, woohoo, yeah, everything's great. But the other part of me is also thinking, well, what about the fact that we're supposed to be measuring down to less than the thickness of a human hair? Now, if you take a look at the box, that's not enough zeros. We need another zero. So even on the device itself, it has four zeros below the decimal point there. But the last one doesn't really do anything proper. It's just a zero or a five. And even then, I don't trust it. Now, in reality, you can easily spend $1,000 on any one of these measuring tools. This one that we have, the digital caliper, is very much like an inside micrometer. And to get much more detail than what we have, we need an outside micrometer. Of course, I marched off to my local Harbor Freight and found they had this one, and it has enough zeros, so I bought it. When I got it home, I found that it had these fairly merciless looking jaws on them but in the packet with no instructions comes this sort of ball bearing type attachment and when I use that with these bearings it kind of worked the curve sort of fit all right now feeling like I might be armed with the right tools I started taking some measurements started writing some stuff down I was dreaming of what kind of graph these numbers might make I was beginning to think of all of the assumptions I might come to and then unfortunately it completely broke. 
like fell apart. You can't put it back together. I thought it just came unscrewed, but no, it's over. No! So really, to do this job properly, you don't have to spend $1,000 on any one of these tools, but you definitely need to spend more than $100 and certainly more than the $40 that I spent on the micrometer that I got from Harbor Freight. I do love Harbor Freight. It's very helpful. If you're looking for axle stands that you might use twice a year, that's the place to go. But I think for robust precision measuring tools, maybe not. If you're enjoying these videos, don't be shy. Go ahead and click on the subscribe button. Yes, Amber likes that. Thank you. Welcome to the stage, Plasti Gauge. Now, I had never heard of this stuff before. Thank you, subscriber Don Esper. Yes, you. Thank you very much. This cost me an entire $6. You get a red one and a green one. We're going to use the green one because that's able to measure smaller distances. Starting off, we're going to plastic gauge with the old main bearings. So there's the red one. We're not going to use that. Green one, yes. So then you cut into it. I'm sure everyone has their own little way of doing it. Inside is this like thick fishing line made of green plastic. You cut it to the size of the bearings and you're supposed to put it slightly off center. I'm not sure I fully understood that at this stage. Some of them are off center just because. Once they're all in there, then we're gonna put the crank shaft on top of them then I'm using the flashlight just to see if any fell out when I wasn't looking. Here now we're putting the plastic gauge, same dealio, but just on top of the crankshaft and then putting the bearing carrier with the old bearings still in it on top. Then that rubber mallet, it's, it's time to shine. I've never actually had a job before where it actually was a good idea to use the rubber mallet, but this time it was. These are still the old bearing carrier bolts. I did buy new ones, but for these tests, I'm just going to reuse the old ones and use the new ones only when I plan on leaving it together permanently. The bearing carrier bolts are all this 12.10 millimeter and welcome a new toy to the garage. This is a torque wrench, also from Harbor Freight, hopefully not as ill-fated as its previous friends. The reason I got this one is partly because it's digital and partly because it also has a built-in angle indicator as well that you need for torquing these bolts. It sounds like this. I set it to seven Newton meters. It beeps like that and then it's getting closer and then the solid beep means that you got there. Now, I won't play that to you too many times because it's very annoying. So here we go. Just to find some trust in this machine, I just went and did everything at seven Newton meters and it seemed pretty good, seems trustable. Now these numbers I was able to find through friends on the internet. Thank you again, Lee Jenkins at Hartech UK. The bearing carrier, 20 Newton meters is recommended and the Conrod bolts are the same. And so here I'm going up to 20 Newton meters. And then once you've got them all to 20 Newton meters, you're supposed to tighten them all to 90 degrees. I had already tested this one two degrees, and so I did another 88 degrees using the digital device. As it approaches the correct angle, it just beeps like crazy and then goes a solid beep. So it went round in some sort of diagonally rotating -y pattern to tighten all of those up to 20 Newton meters. And then once you get them all tightened up, you undo them all immediately have to be immediately but there's, there's no reason to wait and then the rubber hammer gets its finest hour again it's reason to live okay so what did that glean for us taking a look at the journals here I'm going to number them there's seven of them total and you use the wrapper that the plastic gauge came in to gauge the thickness of the squished plastic blobs that it leaves behind. Now, I was wondering about the clarity of the blobs and the fact that that one there, just where I'm working, was totally missing on one side. And that really is down to having oil residue. This crankshaft is not clean enough right now for plastic gauge. I know that now because I did it a second time and it came out much better. And we're gonna look at that a little later on.
Okay, enter our Etsy creation. Now they ended up all sticking to the crankshaft, which is fine, as long as you can find them. Now these ones, because they were on the bottom, were worse. And so you might think, oh my gosh, they're, they're really badly squished and that means I've got this terrible clearance issue. But really what happened is the plastic gauge is supposed to melt if any of it's remaining. It's supposed to melt in the oil and just disappear into your engine and not harm anything. And so what it's done here is because there's oil residue in these bearings and on the crankshaft itself, it's kind of dissolved itself a little bit. And you can see here on the very end, on the rear main seal end, the flywheel end, that was unreadable. So yeah, cleaning is really very important here and that's what we're gonna do next. I have decided I'm not going to use any water at all in cleaning any part of the engine. There's all kinds of ways of doing it and you can do, you can cook them in a vat of oil if you wish, um, but I'm not going to do any of that. I'm going to just use the brake cleaner and then those Kim wipes and then that's the air from the air bubble that we have uh, bolted on the wall in the tiny garage and that did a pretty good job. Now the crankshaft also is going to get a bath. We're using our homemade crankshaft stand for that. And the beauty of that brake cleaner is it does just evaporate away. And so you end up with a dirty sheet underneath, but uh, you don't really have to wash anything. You can just keep reusing that for the same dirty jobs. After a bit of work, it ended up looking really very shiny indeed. And I'm glad I did it. Part of the reason for being glad I did that is I ended up figuring out what this was. When I was messing around with some of the bearing carrier and cleaning it, that fell out. And I was like, oh my God, where did it go? But there's three of them on bank two on that side. I'm not quite sure why. There is an oil hole that goes through there to it. So that must have something to do with it. But I did take a look here and that hole right there goes onto the hole in the bearing and allows that slot in the bearing to fill up with oil and then that can pass oil through to the crankshaft through those small holes then they travel at a diagonal through to the journals for the big end bearings giving them oil also so that's how the oil gets from the outside of the bearing carrier all the way through the main bearings and the big end bearings Okay, now we're gonna fit the new main bearings now that everything's nice and clean. And now we're gonna plastic gauge the new main bearings. Same procedure as before really, but I'm a bit more organized this time. I made a little gauge on the side on that piece of paper so I can know what size the plastic gauge needs to be cut to. It made it a bit quicker and a bit more consistent. And then tweezers and a plastic pen just made it much easier and more accurate to lay the plastic gauge in place. Okay, putting the crankshaft on and now we're going to put plastic gauge on the top of the crankshaft journals. There is the fabled toothpick from last week from the Variocam Extravaganza. Very helpful in the tiny garage. Putting in the other bearing shells, you can see there they all have that one little foot on the side and that will only fit in one way and so there's not really a big challenge to fitting them. Then putting the bearing carrier on top, really the exact same procedure as last time, but this time we have a cleaner bearing carrier and fresh bearings. That's a glimpse into my tightening pattern. I'm trying to do something that makes sense, tightening everything evenly, you know. This time also, rather than chasing the bearing carrier around my workbench, I am strapping it down. Here we go again. This time we're going up to the 20 newton meters, a aerial view of the new torque wrench. I quite like it, to be honest. I mean, it really lets you know where you're at. So once I've done it, just because, you know, my brain's going, I uh, mark each one with a dot. Now here I'm coming back. This is doing the angle. I've done all of them to 20 newton meters. Now I've got to do them all to 90 degrees. I'm putting my thumb on the speaker there to make it less annoying. 
Okay, I did invest in a very basic breaker bar and it's helpful. It is spring loaded so you can stand it straight up in the air and that makes it kind of quick for taking out bolts. It's a handy thing to have in the garage. Okay, the rubber mallet gets its joy again. And let's take a look here. Now you'll immediately notice how much drier and consistent everything looks. Much better. And they're all pretty much fitting in that widest green section on the plastic gauge gauge slash wrapper. And that's 0 0.025 millimeters. Now you don't have to remember that right now. We're going to talk about all those numbers. But the point here is how easy this all is and kind of how fun it is. And what we're seeing is that the readings are consistent and that's important. These are now from the other side of the bearing carrier. And really the same story is true. A much better reading, much more consistent. And they're all pretty much that same thing, 0 0.25 millimeters. Well, what does it all mean? If you remember at the beginning of this video, we talked about the fact that a human hair has a diameter of 0 0.002 inches in diameter. Now, call me European, but I am more comfortable in millimeters than I am in inches. And so let's convert that to millimeters for a second. Okay, it's 0 0.05 millimeters. Notice how we're able to get rid of a zero right there. That's because a millimeter is 25 times smaller than an inch. Because the unit of measurement we're using is smaller, we don't need as many decimal points. What about if we went to an even smaller unit of measurement? A millimeter is splitting a meter stick into 1,000 tiny little sections. What would happen if we split that same meter stick into 1 million pieces? Well, if you do that, those are called micrometers. And it kind of makes sense. You use a meter stick to measure meters, and you use a micrometer to measure micrometers. Well, some people call them micrometers, but I know now that the cool kids call them microns. Now, did I think at the beginning of this week that I would be talking to you about measuring things in microns? No, but it does seem to be in this microscopic realm, a really good unit of measurement to use because it makes it kind of simple. Take a look at this. We said that the thickness of a human hair is 0.05 millimeters. Well, in microns, that's 50 microns. Looks simpler already, right? Going forward, we're going to use microns for everything because it's cool. All right, let's get on with it. If you remember, Plastic Gauge told us that the clearance for our main bearings is 0.025 millimeters. Well, let's do a quick conversion into microns. 25 microns. Lovely. All right, time for a graph. If you look on the graph here on the left hand side, we have 10 through 100 microns of clearance. There's a little Porsche 911 like my one. And the clearance that we got was 25 microns using the plastic gauge. Now, according to the plastic gauge instructions, they have a little formula you can follow. And it says a general starting point for all kinds of vehicles would be 45 microns. Now, according to Wikipedia, the smallest clearance that you could expect on a plain bearing is about 10 microns of oil thickness. And then lastly, through searching many forums, I did find that the specs for a 1980s Porsche 911 SC is somewhere between 10 and 72 microns of clearance on your main bearings. Now, I think you would agree, we're kind of threading the needle pretty well there. I really don't think that's any cause for concern. Everything was pretty consistent. Many of you out there do know what the real number should be for the clearance on the main bearings of a 2001 Porsche 996. I would love to know. While we're all savvy with this microscopic world, let's have a little bit of fun. So how thick is a piece of paper? Well, the edge of a piece of paper is 100 microns thick, which is huge. What about a bacteria? Your average bacteria is five microns across. What about a single strand of spider silk? That's actually three microns. It's smaller than bacteria, which is crazy. Now, one of my favorite small creatures is a tardigrade, also known as a water bear. Look at that little fella. Now, those guys are a huge 500 microns. Oh my gosh, it's a whole new world. I think we can all agree that measuring to within one ten thousandth of an inch is hard. And if you're going to blueprint an engine, 
that's just the beginning of it. So did Mick blueprint his engine? Well, maybe people do. Now, those are also the same kind of people that build fully functional steam engines in their garden shed. They're also the same kind of people that will take a brand new race engine and somehow know how to make it better. So I think for the rest of us, you might want to stick with our trusty friend Plastigage. It's cheap, it's quick, it's kind of fun, and it'll give you an idea on what's going on. What it will also do is make you look at your engine parts and tell you if you maybe need to call your local machine shop. So I did, I called my local machine shop, they work with Porsches, and what he said was very interesting. He said, if you think there's a problem with your crankshaft, sure, they have a service where they will clean it, they will visually inspect it, and then they will check the balance. And they said on parts like that, and engine parts in general, if it's gonna go wrong, it's gonna go pretty wrong. And the visual inspection is very important. And so he said that on this crankshaft, it, it looks so nice, and then if you compare that with the plastic gauge saying that everything was pretty consistent, then really what he's saying is, if it's not broke, don't fix it. And so if you wanted to, for example, turn this into a race car engine, he said then, yeah, maybe they could take that crankshaft and maybe they could get the balance better than Porsche could. But in most cases, clean it, new bearings, stick it back in. So that's the moral of today. For us mere mortals, you are better if it isn't broken, don't fix it. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for this week. Thank you very much for watching. Till next time. <laughs>